Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is category theory. Today's topic are products and co-products. Or, well, vector spaces are again pretty cool, we'll see. Um, kind of what I would like to explain in the end are limits and we need to have seen a lot of, well, examples to really understand what limits are. Or I think you need to have seen a lot of examples to understand what limits are. This kind of a general set up in category theory. Category theory lists from as examples. So uh, let's ex discuss some examples of limits today without actually explaining what limits are. But you will see later um, that they fit very nicely into a much more general setup. Um, yeah, so as I said, the main example or the first example for today are vector spaces. So vector spaces are so extremely nice, kind of the nicest category around uh, vector spaces. So beautiful. Everything kind of works in vector spaces as you would expect it to work, as you would hope it to work, and products and co-products, for example, are also very easy in vector spaces. So in vector spaces, there is one operation, uh, which is kind of the addition of vector spaces, the direct sum of vector spaces, and it satisfies those uh, universal type of properties. So every map from uh, into a direct sum so here is some other vector space X and they have a map into a direct sum. So in this sense here, um, it's kind of uniquely determined by what it does on X and Y. So in this uh, setup of the universal uh, diagrams, you have a map, uh, you have a set space X and you have maps into X and Y. So X, uh, well, maybe I shouldn't call it X, maybe I should call it Y and Z here, um, which is not quite what I write down below, but it doesn't really matter. So y plus z, um, and every map is uniquely determined by what it does to x and y. So in other words, there exists a unique map into the direct sum such that if you know what it does on x and y, you know what the, what the map is. It exists uniquely, right? Um, and the way to do this is to have this commuting diagram here with the two projections to the first factor, the projections to y in this notation, and the projection to x in this notation on the other side. And you always have you always have that, right? So um, it's a tuple. The direct sum is a tuple. So everything you do is determined if you whatever when you know it on the first entry and you know it on the second entry. And kind of vice versa, every map from the direct sum is also determined if you know what it does on the first factor and if you know what it does on the second factor. So every map from the direct sum is also uniquely determined by what it does on x and y. Right, so uh, it's a pretty, pretty nice setup. And no, actually no other object, no other vector space has this property or any of those two properties. So kind of the direct sum is very unique in the sense. It's, un it's the uh, object that is uniquely determined by its two factors, right? So it's uniquely determined by whatever left and right factor um, in the setup of vector spaces. And Another example, in sets, it's not quite as nice, right? The kind of flame, uh, the framework here is vector spaces, super nice. Sets, not too bad, but still a little bit fishy. Sets select some structure. Sets is not a very perfect category in some sense. It's very easy, of course, but maybe not very perfect. And you have the same setup. So every map into the product is uniquely determined by what it does on its factors, but the converse is not quite true. For the converse, you would need to take the, um, the disjoint union. So every map from the disjoint union is uniquely determined by what it does on its factors. So here you have uh, the product and here you have the disjoint union. Okay, so disjoint union and product, two different, two different kind of dual concepts and sets. They just tend to agree for vector spaces. So vector spaces, it's the same. Uh, for sets, it's not quite the same, but still you have the same framework here. No other sets have those properties. No other set has this property that the product has. No other set has a property that the disjoint union has. And if, if you know those two examples, you kind of think, hmm, there's something going on here. There's something non-trivial going on here. And maybe this is kind of more general and doesn't just hold for vector space and sets. And maybe the next category you would try is Cobordisms, my cobordism category, which kind of lacks too much structure anyway. So um, they're very, very far away from being vector spaces. This is this category where um, you have some kind of natural numbers, which just endpoints somewhere, um, let's say four and six, and you could just draw some kind of kind of 
cobalt and pictures between them, something like this. And you could stack them together and multiply them in a very nice way. But in this setup here, kind of no object can be easily split into a left or right part, and no object for neither for ingoing nor for outcoming. Um, so neither for ingoing nor for outgoing. Um, cobaltism, you can never kind of split it into left and right. So you can never kind of say, oh, I have a natural cut here. So what should be a natural cut? I don't really know what it should be. So and there is no natural cut because you can kind of draw any kind of fancy cobaltism. That's not quite a proof, but um, if you think think this a little bit further, you can actually show that no object here really classifies as a as kind of a direct sum or a product or a disjoint union type thing. So no object really has those properties. Um, so cobaltism lacks structure. So vector spaces really nice, say for direct sum, which are uniquely determined by two prop kind of dual properties. In sets, they do these properties split. You have one of them for the product, you have one of them for the disjoint union. And in this kind of non-set based category here, uh, just nothing, just nothing really works. Uh, nothing really qualifies. And this kind of the general setup that you see here. So if you have those guys, um, then they exist and they're unique up to unique isomorphism. So they're as unique as it gets, but they might not exist, right? So in vector spaces, they exist and no other vector space satisfies those properties. They're unique. In sets, kind of the same, but they are not, not the same anymore. You have a product and a different union, but they might not exist at all. And the concept here is the concept of a product or co-product, which people uh, usually write following the notation from sets. So the product is a product and the co-product is a, a different union, um, together with the corresponding projection arrows or inclusion arrows. So uh, for one of them, it's a projection, for the one, it's a dual, it's inclusion and the corresponding universal type of diagrams that you see here. Um, so the usual, uh, in this usual framework, the universal object is this whole datum. So it's actually the object together with the uh, projection maps, respectively. It's the object together with the inclusion maps. And the universal part is whenever you have something mapping from above in this way or mapped to from above, mapped to from above in this way, um, then, um, yeah, well, there's a unique arrow here. So this unique exists uniquely this F map here um, that makes this diagram commute, which in this case really just says it's determined by its two factors, right? Either for outgoing maps or for incoming maps. Depends a bit whether you have a product or a co-product. And the direct sum is this funny uh, co-product product thing when the direct sum in a category exists if you just, it's a co-product and a product at the same time. This is very similar to the initial and terminal object that we have seen before. And yeah, it, it should be because it's kind of part of the same uh, idea of a limit. But right now we don't really know what a limit is. We would need a few more examples to come up with a good definition. We just observe here um, that this makes sense in the categorical language, right? You can write down those diagrams. You can ask for certain maps to be uniquely, uh, to exist uniquely, and that determines um, the product or the co-product. Again, keep in mind, they might not exist. Keep my uh, example of the cobaltism category in mind. They might not exist, right? If they exist, we are good. They are unique up to unique isomorphism, as unique as it gets, but they might not exist. So here's my picture, co-product and product. They're kind of this dual object, right? The product is everything in red. I say it again. So the product is actually the whole collection here of uh, an object and two arrows and the co-product is kind of the same, it's just everything reversed. And um, the universal part of this diagram is this dotted part here. Um, so whenever you have some map, something mapping in or you have something mapping map, map to, it's the map here in, in the middle is uniquely determined. That's kind of the point. So this one here is uniquely determined. This, is uniquely. this was this idea I said again of being determined by left and right, which doesn't quite always work. And right, in vector spaces, they agree. In general, these two concepts do not agree. It can actually be actually happen that one of them exists and the other doesn't. Could be completely possible if your category is somehow unbalanced. In some um, and there's some slight catch for, finite, for infinite dimensional products and that, because then they don't agree anymore in vector spaces. But let's ignore this. Right now, I only have two factors and then product and co-product are just the same. Okay, so what have we seen today is another instance of a limit without actually mentioning 
or defining what a limit is. So it's this idea that a map, let's say in vector spaces, from the direct sum or into the direct sum is uniquely determined by left and right, right? So I can write down a unique diagram in, a, in some sense. You can write down this uh, universal property type diagram. And as soon as you've written that down and you realize, hmm, that's actually not so specific about vector spaces, you can ask that in any category, then you have just defined product and coproduct, right? Product and coproduct are this collection of an object and two morphisms, either, either incoming or outgoing, depends a little bit what you have, together with a universal property. And that's what makes them very unique and that's what makes them so useful, right? The point is, right, as soon as they exist, I say it again, they're unique up to unique isomorphism, which explains why they are so useful everywhere in mathematics or why they are so useful whenever they appear. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video and I also hope to see you next time.